Hi, my name is Kyle Brown, and I, I am a student in Chem 5530 in this fall 2020 semester. Today, this video will cover the physical principles behind the formation of membraneless organelles and egg cells. So just as a quick background, uh, for those of you who need a refresher, a classical membrane-bound organelle is something that you should all know from biology. It's like the examples are the nucleus, the mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum. These are all uh, functional compartments within the cell that have a membrane surrounding the outside of them. And typically, these function to compartmentalize biological reactions and the relevant biomolecules needed for them. Now, membraneless organelles are very similar, except they are not bounded by a membrane. You can see this in the uh, image on the slide here. In that zoomed in part, you can see that there are just protein chains that are interacting with each other to form a mass, and there is no outside membrane like you see in the nucleus on the left. Examples of this are the nucleolus, stress granules, casual bodies. These are all topics of current research in the field that everyone's very interested in. Now, uh, some of the, in terms of how these form, it's done by multivalent and non-covalent interaction of proteins, DNA, and or RNA. Any combination of these three can be relevant or can be in there depending on where this condensate is and what its function is. So what this means in terms of multivalent and non-covalent is that a key biomolecule, often referred to as either a driver or scaffold, that can undergo these types of interactions somehow coalesces at a desired site. The lab I'm a part of actually does some work regarding phase separation and, our, and in the paper we most recently published on an epigenetic protein, we propose that low affinity interactions with DNA actually slow down the diffusion of this protein enough that it can aggregate at ideal sites. And that will then form a seed that will uh, then recruit the client biomolecules into the condensate. Condensate is just another word for these membraneless organelles. It's shorter, so that's what I'll probably use for the rest of this video. Now, that's the phase separation part of the name, but what about the liquid-liquid part? So that just indicates that these condensates exhibit liquid-like properties, similar to that of the liquid surrounding them, be that the cytoplasm or the nucleoplasm, if it's a nuclear condensate. Components within this condensate can easily diffuse, and the loud molecules are allowed to either pass in and out very easily. So some of the physical principles behind why these condensates actually form are um, kind of interesting. So in general, systems tend towards lower energy states. This is often achieved through maximizing entropy, but the contributions to energy states are both enthalpic and entropic. Typically, in complex multi-component systems like those seen in biology, uh, the components of the system actually mix as this allows for greater possible combinations of molecular makeup. So, AKA, they maximize their entropy. Uh, to help understand this idea, we can look at the equation for Gibbs free energy, which is on the slide here, delta G, which is Gibbs free energy, equals the change in enthalpy minus temperature times the change in entropy, where a lower delta G would indicate a lower energy state. Now, molecules that typically engage in phase separation have motifs favorable for strong interactions with other molecules of the same type. For example, proteins often have what's called intrinsically disordered regions that are full of polar, they're rich in polar and charged amino acid residues, allowing them to interact with each other and proteins containing this region very easily. And so while demixing, which is what happens when these components of phase separate from each other. Demixing will decrease entropy, which is typically unfavored. They will, however, also have a large change in, in, in enthalpy. And so enthalpy will also become a lot smaller number, hence a lower energy state. And that's why these condensates are actually favored in living systems. 
So now we know why they form. We want to know what is the purpose of these condensates? Why do biological systems form them? And the very obvious one that I'm sure everyone could think of here is that they organize chemical reactions in space, the same as a membrane bound organelle. So these organization of chemical reactions allow for sharp concentration gradients between inside the condensate and outside, allowing for certain reactions to uh, proceed much quicker within them. Furthermore, these uh, condensates are advantaged have an advantage over typical membrane-bound organelles in that they can react quickly to stimuli. So when a cell is stress, it forms stress granules right away. Uh, then also the cell can modulate how, how efficiently these condensates are forming and how much they are speeding up their relevant reactions through things like post-translational modification or altering the speed of an ion channel to change the charge in the environment. That will also affect the type of interactions going on between proteins or between strands of DNA. Furthermore, changes in pH can also affect this as it will then ionize and deionize your specific residues of the protein and alter their interactions again. And finally, uh, something we found in our paper that has also been reported across multiple other works is that these condensates function to speed up the target search process of a protein. Target search process is what scientists call it, call how long it takes a protein to find its specific uh, components for reaction. So for example, in our work, we have a protein that interacts with DNA. Well, there's a lot of nonspecific sites on the DNA relative to the one specific one that it wants. And so this protein spent a lot of time going around and forming non-specific interactions with DNA before it finally found what it wanted. But in the presence of these condensates, it pulls in the DNA and the target sites into a small area that this protein can now visit quickly and easily. And that then increases its efficiency. And this is very important for lots of cellular functions as it wants to be operating at peak efficiency. So here are my citations. I hope you learned a lot. Have a good day.